points. Um, so this is a buff, which means bird of a feather. Um, I won't explain the whole reason, but the idea is um, there's not much presentation prepared. It's just for you guys to interact with us. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about what we are doing and we're planning to do. So you can maybe think, oh yeah, I need this, or I want that, or I want to ask a question about this or that. And otherwise, you've got pretty much the, I guess, Red Hat sponsored Hibernate, uh, you know, committers or helpers or anything related to that. Uh, because we're doing a face-to-face -face this week here, just like uh, one level up. And uh, we figured out just last week, hey, how about we do a buff about and interact with the uh, people that are here. So. Thanks for the Paris <laughs> joke to be super reactive on, on that. So. Thanks, thanks very much. And I guess I'll let Sunny do the quick intro on this. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, the idea is uh, really that you ask the questions, but since you might have no idea of what we have been doing recently, we are starting with a very brief overview. This is like a super trim it down version of some of our presentations glued together. So I'm just going to mention a lot of interesting topics, and then you know you can stop us at any time and ask questions, or maybe better we ask all the questions at the end so that you know if it's already covered. Um, I, I really don't have time to make examples of the things, so it's really more like things that might pick your interest. Are you interested? There is an idea. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, we start with a refresh of an overview of the various projects that we have, and then we focus on what's new, what we're planning to do in the immediately foreseen future, and then you know, we go on with questions. So as you might know, or maybe not, Hibernate is a bit more than Hibernate ORM. This is now an extract of the new website, which, by the way, we have a new design, and it's, the content is organized much better, the documentation is totally new. So if you haven't been there for a while, I would suggest to go and have a look. So you know about Hibernate ORM. We also have Hibernate Search, Hibernate Validator, Hibernate OGM, and Tools, and some more things that we're going to mention later. And, well, of course, you know a bit of where Hibernate fits in. It's uh, a JPA implementation, so it's part of Java Enterprise. Uh, I mean, it's widely used by Java Enterprise users. It's part of Wildfly and JBoss AIP, so if you're using any of these products, you probably are using Hibernate in there. It's also used by Spring, by Spring Boot, by Grails, and lots of other frameworks. So you might be aware of using it directly, or maybe it's used behind the scenes, but uh, it's always useful to know or have a general idea of what's going on here. So you know the Java Persistence API? I guess, yeah, okay. <laughs> So, of course, it's a standard. Uh, Hibernate ORM implements this interface, and um, we often influence the next generation of the specification. So, like JPA 2.2 uh, came out recently. We're working now to get it, uh, to, to get Hibernate up to date to implement the JPA 2.2 specification. But what you can see also is like what they pretty much standardize it is things that we have been doing in Hibernate community before. So it's easy for us to do the work. And, uh, but it's nice to see that there is this feed between the things that actually work in Hibernate go into the specification and the rest maybe not. Um, so about Hibernate 5, what we did is uh, we cleaned up the bootstrap phase, which uh, was a bit complex to follow before. We've been focusing more on the modularity of the system, so it needs to work better in OSGI environments. That was a bit uh, messy, hackish before. It also has which, to work... Which using OSGI on a regular basis? <laughs> yes. oh, One person. Okay. <laughs> we spent so much time for you. <laughs> 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 and well, of course, it has to work in uh, JBoss models, which means in Wildfly as well. And uh, in Java 9, we have been looking ahead what's going on in Java 9 and making sure that this wasn't going to cause a problem. And... Um, <laughs> what about? Um, we're we're testing with it. Uh, Maven doesn't work yet, so uh, we're a bit stuck with some things. I tried working around Maven. I have some custom build. It's working. Well. So the question so is what about good. Java 10? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. 
of course, other things we did in our M5 is well the uh, the way of integrating or extending the framework is become nicer, cleaner. I say it's much nice, easier for us. Like especially like we develop other things, so we experiment with this. And a lot of work has been done in the performance area. So we have a dedicated performance team who give us like really good feedback, and we have been working on this as well ourselves. Like uh, memory allocation is uh, much much lower, it's much more lightweight. Um, we support now the Java 8 new date and time types. Oh yeah, which demo version are you using? Eight. Is everybody on 8 here? Seven. Raise the hand who is not on Java 8? <coughs> well, you're on 10. Okay. So a couple more very small improvements like now uh, session, session factory, scrollable results, everything that you really need to close is now auto closable, which makes it nicer also for the IDE to remind you that you really need to close this stuff. Um, at the same time, like the get method is now a properly generic, so you don't have to really cast this. We know that this is an address, so it's well, these are very small uh, improvements, but makes nice it easier. Uh, bytecode instrumentation improved. Um, well, so um, when you use bytecode instrumentation, we can actually change the bytecode of your entities to make sure that we can detect changes that you're applying on the entities with the minimal overhead. Traditionally, like you would have to like the normal dirty checking strategy was uh, not very efficient when you had like large graphs or many objects in your sessions. So now we just have flags within your entity which gets triggered when you're actually making a change directly. Then we just have to check this, this flag to know what needs to be done. And well, to do this bytecode, you have now Maven plugins and uh, Gradle plugins on top of existing end tasks. And uh, this also allows us to do some additional tricks, like you can do lazy loading of uh, some subgroups and even like properties and uh, fields. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but it, it enables us to also do like lazy loading on actual field objects, which is uh, a bit unexpected because it's not really toxic in an interface. Um, just a question, are you, are you playing well with other frameworks that also like what you can? I am not aware of any problem. Yeah, I haven't seen much uh, in back on that problematic. <laughs> okay, so some of the frameworks you can that we've used, uh, that they're just basically clobbering us when we do it Yeah. So another thing it enables is uh, the, the when you have a bidirectional association, it's able now like before you would need to like remember to update both sides of the relation, which makes sense if you think of it as a Java. It does. It doesn't make much sense if you think of it in terms of uh, the relational tables. Um, so when it's instrumented, we automatically upside, update both sides of the relation. So even if you forget one of these sides, it's not a problem. And well, that's nice. So byte body. Um, to do the bytecode instrumentation, you have now the option to use byte body instead of Java Assist. One of the reasons is, well, in terms of modularity, Java Assist actually requires you to be dependent on Java Assist at runtime, which we don't really like if you want to be you know, clean class path essentially. Another reason is ByteBuddy is using ISM, which is updated more regularly, so this was actually the only way to get it working on Java 9. Java Assist then has been catching up, so it should work as well now, but I'm a bit more confident on ByteBuddy going ahead, so we decided as a team that Java Assist is going to be deprecated. The next version will flip into <coughs> ByteBuddy as default implementation. You can still use the older one, but eventually, this is just going to be byte by the end I send here. 
There are some new database support. So now you can actually use SAP HANA, and you can use uh, CockroachDB, and this is on top of you know, user updates of existing variants. There are optimizations on second level cache. Um, a lot of optimizations have been done in terms of uh, allocating uh, like unnecessary objects. We, we noticed that accessing the second level cache was actually expensive. And so in sometimes it was actually not beneficial for performance to have a second level cache because if you like try to access the cache but you would often have like a cache miss then you are having like a heavy performance cost for something that is not giving you a much high benefit. So we made sure that actually accessing the cache is a very cheap operation in terms of memory and everything else out there. We also have now ability of caching by reference. So you don't really need to have a new copy of your entity every time you're accessing the cache. But if you can guarantee that your entity is totally mutable, you can like share the same entity instance across all your sessions and transactions. And finally, a second level cache, now you can use the Jcache SPI. So before we only had uh, InfiniSpan support and AHCache support, and other cache implementations had their own, but managed it separately. Now we maintain Jcache implementation, so anybody who implements Jcache can plug it directly. I'll keep this for later, maybe. Um, so Hibernate Search. This is uh, a different project. You have seen it on the website screenshot before. We integrate with Hibernate ORM, and uh, what we do is we manage a full text index which has to be in sync with your relational database. So traditionally we have been integrating with Lucene, like it's now close to 10 years old, something like that. But yeah, and we always had this integration with Lucene so that you could focus on the mapping of your object so you are defining how your objects are mapped from the relational database with some additional annotations. You're also telling like these specific fields, I want them indexed in Lucene so that you can then query, either run a relational query in your database or you can run a full text query and we will run this on the Lucene index but then materialize your objects from the relational database in the normal transactional way. So you get materialized objects out of the Lucene query. Um, now we support also Elasticsearch integration as an alternative to the scene. And uh, well, it is focusing on the objects as a domain model. You can also do projections from the Lucene index if you want to like totally bypass the iteration of objects and just want to extract some quick data from the Lucene index, that's possible. And yeah, so what, what's new now? Um, Fundamentally, in, in version 5, we have been able to upgrade Lucene while maintaining our APIs stable so that we can easily migrate to this version. We had here as well lots of performance improvements. We always keep working on that. And since version 5.6, you have this Elasticsearch integration. It was experimental before, then we have been maturing it in the recent minor versions. We're at 5.9, it's getting quite good. Um, working on Wildfly Swarm and Spring Boot integration. This is how it looks like, by the way. If you have a mapped domain object, this is like an entity. You have to add indexes on top of it to have this object being considered by the indexing engine. And then you have to opt in on which of the fields you want to be indexed. And there are some additional annotations to specify more advanced options. For example, if you need it to be like sortable, there is a specific annotation for that. There is support for faceting, spatial queries, and uh, embedding a bit more rich structures in the index as well. Okay, what are we doing for Hibernate Search 6? This is some of the stuff that we have been discussing like today, and well, since many months, but one of the purposes of the meeting here is that we are going into more details. So one of the plans is, since now we want to support Elasticsearch better and potentially even other engines we are thinking like Solar and maybe other things, uh, it's nice to avoid leaking all the Lucene types on our API so that we can really give you the, the possibility to migrate from one type to the other type. Or, for example, if you want to use Elasticsearch, it doesn't make any sense to have Lucene in your class path, for example. And Let's talk about Hibernate OGM. David, do you want to take this? <laughs> um, OGM is the JPA implementation. Um, 
the purpose of OGM is to make a GPA uh, standard work with uh, NoSQL DB. Um, we currently have uh, several dialects. Uh, the main we are focusing on is MongoDB, Infinispan, and Neo4j. Um, the idea is that if you're already familiar with JPA, you don't have to learn new uh, API or new interface to work with the uh, NoSQL data store of your choice. Um, Yeah, <laughs> so if, if you already configure Hibernate, uh, there's nothing new to do. You just need to add uh, the right dependency on your project and uh, change uh, the provider, and you're pretty much good to go. Um, OGM will, will uh, reuse the same annotation and the same uh, interface, so I don't have any code to show you that you're not familiar with already. Um, in, um, this is also positive side of this one is that uh, if you have a, if you're already using tools that integrate with the uh, uh, Ibernet or RAM or the, some kind of GPA provider, you can also replace OGM uh, under the hood uh, and uh, it should work out of the box. All right, um, I'm going to uh, and I worked on beam validation and having it to wear data. So is anyone using beam validation? Okay, a couple of you. All right, so very quickly, it's an API which allows you to put constraints to your object model. So you could say a property may not be null or it might be a string in a, which matches a given regular expression, let's say, or a numeric value in a given range. And then beam validation will enforce those constraints in suitable um, points in the object lifecycle. So for instance, if you persist data in the database, beam validation will kick in and validate those constraints before the data is written to the database. And we did a new version of beam validation. Oh yeah, which we see here. Um, so we added a new, a couple of new constraints. So there is a set of constraints built into the spec and we added a couple of new ones. There's now add email, add positive, add negative. Um, there's a couple of constraints which deal with time, which is a bit more flexible and we tried to make this very inclusive in terms of the community. So we were doing some polls, we were asking people on our website and on Twitter and so on, which are the constraints which you are using in your everyday life, which are not yet part of the spec, and then, so that's the constraints which we added. There's this support for con um, container elements now, so this means, um, right, if we have here this list, for instance, you now can say um, this list of strings, it should be a list of emails, and this works by putting the constraints email, in this case, to the type arguments of this uh, generic type list. So this is something which is new in Java 8. You have many more places where you can put annotations. And Beam Validation is taking advantage of this by allowing you to uh, specify constraints for the elements of collections. So it works for list, it works for optional, it works for other things like map keys, for instance, which wasn't possible before. And it also works for your custom container types. So we defined an SPI, an extension point, which allows you to plug in custom, what we call value extractors, and then it would work for you custom containers, let's say Google, Guava, Samantha, Map, for instance. Um, yeah, right, there's uh, repeatable constraints or repeatable annotations. So Java 8 allows you to specify annotations multiple times. We use this here in this example to apply this size constraint and make sure depending on the role which a user has, that different strengths for their password is well addicted to. It also works for JavaFX, so is anyone using JavaFX? Kirk is Java using FX, very good. Um, and here is someone as well. So all those beam validation constraints now also work with the JavaFX type. So what you have there is you don't work usually with string or int and so on, but there's dedicated types like integer property, string property, and all those types are also supported now by beam validation. Uh, new constraints, right, and a couple of other goodies. So there's this initialize method in the constraints where well, the contract, which in many cases you don't need, so that's a default method now, making this a bit simpler for you. And there's a couple of other just yeah, usability enhancements. And this, I think that's it, right? Oh yeah, we did a lot of performance improvements, so this was Guillaume over there. Um, he has uh, been spending quite a lot of time to work on JMH-based benchmarks and then see where we allocate lots of data, where we spend lots of time in terms of runtime overhead, and it's much better now than beam validation before, and also it's faster, I have, uh, can be happy to say this, than the other implementation by Apache. So we are in a pretty good state in terms of performance. Still, we always could improve, of course, but um, I think Guillaume has done a great job here. 
there's a blog post on the in relation, in relation to a blog about it. I mean, it's spatial. Who's that? <laughs> Yeah, well, just to remind that Hibernate also has integration with um, uh, spatial types, and uh, also to not get confused, like both Hibernate Search and Hibernate ORM are uh, having extensions for spatial queries. The difference really is that when you're using the Hibernate Search spatial extensions, uh, well, unfortunately, they don't really map the same types because they have different capabilities. So Hibernate Search will uh, add spatial restrictions on your other full text queries. It means it's going to run through the Lucene index. While Hibernate or M, the spatial extensions are able to map uh, more complex spatial types mapping to the actual capabilities of your relational database. And Hibernate Enverse. So this is a project that started a long time ago, but then didn't really have a maintainer, and uh, so it was a bit uh, more, let, let's say, less loved than, than the other projects. Now we have Chris working on it full time, so uh, it's improving a lot. If you tried it a while back, it's probably worth trying it uh, again. What is it? Yeah. Do you want to explain it? <laughs> so, um, Hibernate Inverse, for any of you that are not familiar with it, is basically a framework that allows you to be able to, as you're uh, using your JP provider to go through and persist objects, you're able to actually mark specific fields, very much like Hibernate Search, um, but using different annotations to mark fields, of mark classes, in order for those to be uh, tracked in special tables, so you guys can then later use the inverse query API and be able to get those results back out of the database and be able to know at a particular snap point or snapshot in time what that particular entity looked like, what the associations were, um, that sort of thing. So um, we've been making a, a lot of uh, improvement changes on this. Uh, a lot of them are scheduled for Hibernate 6. Um, a lot of those are going to come in to doing some better conditional auditing capabilities, um, some new annotations, a, a lot of code refactoring. Um, we're also uh, taking that particular project as well, and it's actually being wrapped into ORM core proper, so you guys will be able to get that without having to import any other dependency. So, speaking of Hibernate 6, we have Steve. <laughs> So why don't you introduce us about the semantic query model? Um, so for a while we've been using Antler as a um, parser for HQL. Um, so we backstory is we used to have multiple ways that we would um, generate SQL and execute it. So this new model is just about generating a single representation of the SQL. The first, you know, the, typically the way you do parsing is multiple. Let me put this down. I talk with my hands a lot. Um, so typ typically you um, would have multiple phases, right? So you would do like a, um, an initial parse phase, and then it's kind of like a, an interpretation of what's called semantic information, right? So this SQM just represents the semantics of what you're trying to accomplish in any kind of SQL, HQL, JPQL, criteria query, whatever it happens to be. So we build a singular representation of all of those things. And then from that point forward, we can, you know, run it through the same pipeline, if you will. So semantic query model, um, you know, it, it would look familiar if you're, if, if you're, you know, understanding SQL, you'd have um, a select thing, but it's just a tree structure that represents the, uh, the query. And then you can walk it multiple times, visit it, um, perform interesting things on it. So like, for example, we were just talking today about how this could play with, or how OGM could tie into this, right? So we would have a semantic query model, but OGM, for example, would interpret that differently. But all of the infrastructure up front would be the same. ORM would just generate that, hand it off to OGM, and it would do some, some different things. Um, but, you know, again, it comes out, there's some other changes that are coming from this. It all comes from the performance team. So this is all performance driven. Um, so there's a lot of improvements in terms of how we're um, performing SQL. I mean, that's ultimately what it's all about. So a lot of performance improvements. Uh, well, Jandex is going to be later, but um, yeah, more performance, um, new connection pooling. Um, so we're going to have a production ready connection pooling built into Hibernate so you don't have to plug in a new one. And it's all based on 
this, I can never know how to pronounce it. Is Luis Aru? No. Agro, it's, yeah. Um, basically, it's a new, uh, it's kind of like just Hikari. Um, it's bike, you know, it does some bike code enhancement. It does, it's a very performant connection pool. Um, so we're going to plug that in as our default connection pool. Oh, yeah, and we're actually starting to incorporate JMH, JMH <coughs> performance testing into our um, test suite. And the idea is what we eventually want to get to is to be able to snapshot it at various, well, as we build snapshots or as we build versions, we want to make sure we're not regressing, not only in correctness, like you would do with a normal unit test, but also we're not regressing in terms of performance. You know, we're not getting worse. Don't you mind coming huh? from? Don't you mind coming oh. in from? Um, I don't sit well in <laughs> Um, yeah, oh, so OSGI has been a, um, something that we've worked on um, a few different times, um, so we're going to do some, some additional work with that for, uh, for 6 as well. Just trying to make it more performant, bring it up to date with Java 9, some of the new things that are coming out, um, you know, modules, we've already all talked about that. Um, <coughs> Just before we move to Java 9, the, so the reason we wrote yet another connection pool, uh, we were very happy with Hikari, Hikari uh, but it doesn't support XA and the whole GTA kind of semantic. And uh, for the app server, that's a really important part of our thing. And when we looked at it, there was no really super easy way to, you know, change it to make it work. So the, the performance team, which uh, He's on a benchmark that is uh, very database heavy and database driven. He decided to do that work, and it's it's been going on for a little while, and it feels that it's ready right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, just to remind that. Uh, well, as I said before, we've been checking regularly for Java 9 uh, previews, what it would imply for us, and uh, the, if you download the latest versions of Hibernate, all of these will just work fine. Um, with the exception of, well, in the Hibernate OGM case, we often depend on what the NoSQL providers are doing, and in some cases we are not entirely there yet, so that will depend on the NoSQL. And uh, also not as models yet, like the Hibernate components, they are not modularized, so you can't really run them as models, but it, they will just run in Java 9 uh, without the warnings. Oh, well, beam validation has a model. Yeah. Well, uh, so what we have for beam validation is there's this notion of um, automatic modules, and um, this means essentially you take a non-modularized jar and run it as a module, and then there will be some semantics applied which make this a module for you. And what we do there is we define already module names. So um, if you depend on <coughs> validation and hybrid validator, on the module path, we would already give you properly defined module names. So this works and it's a bit tested, so this should be fine. Ah. OK, um, so just quickly. About another project which is called Debezium, and this is not a project of the Hibernet umbrella, and it's a bit different from the others, so it's not a library which you would embed into your application, which you then would call, um, but instead it's a tool which you essentially can use ready made. And the purpose of it is to track all the changes which happen in your database and then emit them as events which allows or which enables many interesting use cases, which I will um, dive into in a bit. So the idea is. Divisium for um, hooks into your database um, for you. And so what we do there is we um, monitor essentially the transaction log and we emit um, events for all the insults, all the updates, all the deletes, and we will send those events uh, via Kafka. So you would have set up a Kafka cluster and then there's a utility project called Kafka Connect and Divisium uses Kafka or essentially is a Kafka Connect connector and allows you to stream all those data changes. Um, we have support currently for MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB, so the, um, those three are already very well supported. Um, more are coming soon, so right now I'm working on um, support for Oracle. The problem being there's no standard way, no standard API which would allow me to just implement this logic once and then go to all the databases. But instead I need to invest, investigate all the APIs for all the databases and it requires some specific coding on our end. But then for you, those events are largely uniform, so you could can consume them largely in a uniform manner. 
um, it's based on taking the transaction log, and this is very nice because it means there's no calling involved, so you don't go to the database and ask it, let's say, every 10 seconds for changes, but in that, instead we will be triggered if there's a change. Um, and there's also no what's called dual write issues. Um, so let's, for instance, think about the Elasticsearch case. Um, this is not a transaction source, um, or not a transaction resource, so it's not easy or, yeah, not trivial, let's say, to update your database and Elasticsearch in a consistent um, fashion if you drive this from the application itself. But um, whereas the Visium, it sits on a transaction log, so we already know what actually has happened in the database, so we won't see any rollback stuff, which allows us just to send the actually applied changes to those things like Elasticsearch. All right. Um, yeah, some use cases. So for in the simplest case, we just use it to replicate data to another database. So you, let's say you would have a sort of backup. More interesting is uh, data synchronization between microservices. So the idea here is, let's say you have an order service, an item service, and a, a customer service, and all of those services are the primary owner of some subset of the data, right? So the customer service it owns the customer data, and the order service it owns the order data. And now one of those services also might need a subset of the data which is actually owned by the other service. And you could use Debezium to stream the changes, let's say from the inventory service to the ordering service so it knows about the items which are in stock. Um, and then you could apply, for instance, some filtering just to save or to ingest the data you're interested in and you would then store this subset of data locally in your other service. You could use it to stream data to other teams. So let's say you have your marketing team and they would like to run some advertising campaign based on orders which have happened. Usually you would not like the marketing guys to run this kind of query on the production database. Instead, again, you could use the Visium to just stream the data to those guys. And finally, you could use it to update, um, let's say, caches or full text indexes. That's many of use cases, really. And just very quickly, so do changes, what do you, what do you get? Um, so usually you will get the old state of a data row and the new state. Of course, let's say it's an insert, there's just the after state, right? There's no before state. But for an update, you would get before and after. You will get some metadata, when has this change happened, um, and so on. And you can choose between two formats out of the box. So there's JSON support and there's Avro support. JSON, of course, it's human readable, so you can make sense out of this easily. Whereas Avro is much more compact, so it's a binary format, and it really just has a very compact binary representation of the data. And then it uses what's called the schema registry, which allows clients to make sense out of this blob um, to decode the data and restore some meaningful data output. That's it about Debezium, I think. So if there's any questions, go to debezium.io and I will be happy to help you. Or ask me today. Or ask me today, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're done with the overview, so it's definitely up to you to ask anything. <laughs> That's the time where you need to not be shy. Just say, <laughs> so who is the first to ask? I will give you some food first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what, what, what is uh, what is the goal that the benefit of uh, supporting multiple uh, uh, storage engine uh, for uh, Hibernate search? Because uh, Hibernate search was a uh, Lucene base for a very long time, and uh, Elasticsearch used Lucene underneath. So and so d so do Solar. So what are the gain to have an, an abstraction layer between Lucene and Hibernate search and having multiple engines plug into Hibernate search? What are the gain if there are? Oh, the question is why using Elasticsearch rather than Lucene, I guess. Yeah. So, well, if you're using Lucene, um, you have some benefits. Like, we're not removing Lucene. Like, it's more like in some cases, I think Lucene is still the best choice. In some other cases, it might be much, much easier for you to, elast to use Elasticsearch. One of these points is really like the scalability. Like Elasticsearch makes it really easy to scale to very large indexes or like very like horizontally making this Lucene index uh, scalable. If you are embedding it in your application, that means that you need to replicate your own application of the same amount of uh, you know horizontal servers. 
which is actually quite tricky because the Lucene index cannot be stored on a network file share without getting into locking issues and performance issues because if it's not a local disk, you, you're getting uh, quite an annoying performance drawback there. <coughs> Now, we also have been working on alternative storages for uh, Lucene, so you don't have to store it on file system at all. You can plug in Finispan in there, and then you can replicate your index in the Finispan grid. But this is only efficient if you can replicate a full copy of the index on each of your application nodes. So when you're starting to deal with very large indexes or large amounts of data, which is, you know, which would need like replication at the Finispan level, that would still work, but the efficiency of running queries at that level is, is not very compelling anymore. And, well, the setup is a, is a bit harder. Another reason is you might already have Elasticsearch there, and you, you, know, you have multiple applications who are reading or writing to Elasticsearch, and then you just want this other application who's basically hybrid based to push some updates into your existing Elasticsearch uh, cluster. Yep, I've got a couple more. Um, the, well, I had a couple more. <laughs> uh, so if you're already using Elasticsearch, uh, you, and, and you're migrating from two, from 2 to 5 to 6 and so on, you might have realized that you cannot really have the same app running the rich clients with different versions. They tend to break stuff. They are sort of working on a project that would allow them to be independent of their backend and we're uh, working with them a little bit to explore that but it's super low level at the moment so I would be tempted to say that Hibernate Search is kind of a super nice um, a rich client at, at that level that is abstracting you a little bit already from the the, the uh, Elast Elasticsearch uh, you know, actual class dependencies and so on so that's an, a, an interesting one and also Elasticsearch has all of the ecosystem around, right? Kibana, uh, you know, uh, Fluent, no, I forgot the name. Well, the stuff, yeah, Logstash and so on. So, you know, it may be that you want to use Kibana to then explore what you're pushing in, in or if really your app is only about the index and implementing the search engine, maybe just using Lucene is fine. Uh, but if you also want that ecosystem, then there is a lot of benefit in you know jumping the uh, Elasticsearch bandwagon. You wanted to add something? Okay. Yes, I beat you to it. <laughs> uh, you have questions, one of you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we are trying at work to to use uh, domain driven design with uh, Hibernate ORM through uh, GBA, and um, therefore we we think we need. Uh, to, to pass some dependencies from uh, our Spring framework, for example, to make, in fact, a dependency inj injection via the, via the entity uh, constructor. So is that possible with Hibernate, or do we have to, to auto-wire uh, the, the fields uh, uh, like uh, we did uh, before, in fact? Um, well, just to make sure I understood the question. Um, can you do constructor injection to your entities? Am I understanding that correctly? We want to do construction and injection, yes, we can. Um, so part of, well, initially it was part of six, but we're working on JPA 2.2, so we're going to do a, a um, Hibernate 5.3. So we're going to backport this particular thing. But um, we're working on, so for example, right now, we support CDI as a injection framework. but I'm extracting. I'm abstracting that behind a, you know, a, a repository kind of interface that says I can have any back end to my dependency injection. So Spring is obviously one that we would uh, like to implement. Um, what's going to be cool about it is we're going to have anything essentially that we instantiate is going to be open to possibly be part of this. Um, you know, I haven't really. <coughs> considered entities yet because there's some there's some difficulties with that um, in terms of CDI at least I haven't really looked at spring so I'm not too sure about that but uh, you know things like hibernate services you know with JPA you can already do entity listeners uh, attribute converters all, all these kinds of things you know we're already looking at dependency injection but uh, impossible I, I don't know if it'll necessarily be 
constructor injection, if we do end up doing something with spring, it might be you know an afterwards kind of based thing. I'm not I'm not exactly sure what to see. Because I found on the on the web uh, some libraries that uh, that allows to to inject uh, to inject dependencies after the the bin the bin construction the entity construction, but uh, we are looking to to inject those uh, those, uh, those dependencies into the constructor into the constructor to, to make those uh, finals. Uh, for us. Yeah, no, it would be, yeah, I can definitely see the benefit of it, so. It would be cool to have a, a factory uh, extensible with, uh, with an SPI, for example? Um, well, there is. It's Hibernate specific, yes. obviously. I mean, at, at some point, we have to instantiate stuff, so, yeah, I mean, you can plug in the way that that happens, but what you're asking about is a little bit different. Um, but I mean, you know, the initial thought is, well, the thing that does that could also be, um, you know, could also be a hosted being, you know, whether it be Spring, CDI, whatever, and then it could actually just instantiate the objects, whatever, you know, however it chooses to do it. Um, but in terms of, you know, automatically doing it, it's, it, you know, I can definitely see the benefit of it, and it would be cool to do. Um, like I said, it's, there's some added complexity to doing that with entities specifically, but. Yeah, I mean, it's something we would definitely explore. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, if you, you know, want to capture that kind of need, you probably open a Jira, and maybe that would help us, you know, better understand what you what you really want. But also remember that an entity is kind of uh, mutable by default already. So yes, you might have this in inject stuff as final and. It's cleaner so that nobody can update it, but I'm not sure from a performance point of view you will really make a big difference because you still have all of, all of those other fields that are actually usable in, in practice, right? If only because Hibernate needs to, you know, feed them up. But it's not the persistent state, right, that you want to inject. It's just no, 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 that will be yeah. it's, uh, For example, the, the security service, the authorization service, you said, to, to know if, uh, if I have the right to, to update some fields, those, those yeah. kind of stuff. Anybody else like like uh, I'm almost tempted to say religiously following the DDD approach, uh, yeah, domain driven design approach, and really wanted a non anemic domain model. That that's where you're coming from, yeah. right? So, anybody else like more on that 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 form? Okay, and you feel like frustrated by Hibernate <laughs> not doing it, or yes? <laughs> just for the camera, it's just one guy. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But out of curiosity, I, mean, I don't really follow. I don't really follow the other JPA providers all that closely. But is there any that actually does this? I, I don't. Yeah, I, do, I don't think so. But I could be wrong. But it, it's it's a difficult problem in, in many it's levels. Yeah. Yeah. Questions. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for having, having us and thank you for your presentation. My question is about GPA, and Hibernate, and about Criteria uh, API. Um, Which it's one, the GPA one or the Hibernate one? No, it's so for GPA 2.1 and Hibernate 5.2.12. Anyway, um, my question is, is my point of view about Criteria API, I feel it's not maintainable in kind of syntax, and I believe, and, and, and I have uh, tried all the uh, framework like um, query DSL, I query DSL or Joux, and I I don't know if there is a plan to implement this kind of framework to make it easy for writing query and make, uh, make it ma uh, maintainable. Thank you. Before answering the question, we, we tried to make it better, but we were overruled by some people, including Oracle. And <coughs> Unfortunately, this this is you know sometimes when you design inside a JSR, either it works well or sometimes there are conflicting design and uh, somehow the spec lead wants to make a compromise. I'm afraid that specific API was the later, and yeah, it's not really the you know most usable one to be honest. Yes, but I, I, you know, just because of what Emmanuel said, I don't know that I'll necessarily be able to be done through the criteria API. But just going back to like the SQM stuff that we were talking about in the Hibernate 6, one of the other things that we definitely want to look at is um, 
leveraging streams. So, like for example, the ability on an entity manager to say, open a stream, I want to get a stream over users. So all of my user entities, I want to get a stream, and then apply um, you know, all the normal stuff you do on streams, and we would actually interpret that into an SQM, and then ultimately, when you do a, you know, a collect or whatever, <clears throat> go and actually issue the, uh, the query. So it's kind of similar, but it lets you use streaming to accomplish pretty much the same thing, which is a little bit nicer API, I think, personally. I mean, you don't get a lot of the, well, you do get the type safety as well, so I mean, it's, it's a win-win. Just, just one thing, but otherwise, um, you know, we, I think last year actually, we, we explored especially query DSL, and, and frankly, is there much we could add to make it easier to use? They already, you know, support JPA, let you write your JPA query, and you can then execute it on Hibernate, so, you know, just use query DSL, it's, you know, looks fine for, for us and for further usage. Yeah, I was about to say the same for Juke, so you can use the two things together and you could assemble your query using Juke and you would get back managed hibernate entities. So yeah, I would just say use that and it will work for you. <laughs> so I'm throwing the mic and somebody <laughs> has to ask the question if it catches it. Si vous voulez poser la question en français, on peut traduire. Ouais, si vous voulez faire une petite pause d'anglais et en français. Moi, j'avais les, les questions. Euh, donc, j'avais. So, if you remember, uh, I send the, the form for people to ask questions. So, I have two questions actually. The first one is uh, when you have a read only operation, do the autocomic flag turn to false before commit, which makes autocomic from one, set one, set two, then commit? Uh, for production environment, it's uh, very expensive because you have two connection uh, call. Uh, is there a specific reason for that? That's the first question. <laughs> I don't have no any. Idea. I don't have any more context info. Sorry. I don't have more context. Um, so to make sure I understand, so in the at the beginning of an entity manager, you set the auto commit to one. To what? To one. One. True. True. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how controversial this is, but auto commit's kind of a broken concept anyway. So I, I personally don't really put too much effort into it. Um, but if you've got auto commit, right, you, I mean, as you send things to the database, it's just naturally a transaction for everything you send. I mean, it, it's just the way it works. Am I misunderstanding the question? Uh, I think the, the, the question said that when it's a read-only transaction, you put the auto commit to false, and uh, it, it has no gain. Actually, that's. The yeah, we. Uh, I know historically we. Uh, that that's a long time ago, but back in the days we were, you know, testing. Does it make sense to set it to auto commit to true and then have this, you know, one-off transaction for each read operation you're doing versus starting a transaction meaning auto commit to false? during all of your reads and then closing. And it turns out that it depends on the underlying database, uh, but it looks like a better design to say, I'm putting on to commit to force, and at least everything I read is conceptually acid, at least according to the isolation level your database uh, said it would, or no. <laughs> um, so, so in the end, it wasn't like uh, it's cheaper to do just no transaction, because actually it's a micro kind of transaction boundary every time you do an operation versus one explicit one, and then you do your work, and then you're done. I mean, as a matter of fact, every time we do it, every, every time we do it in a major version, I try to convince everybody that we should just get rid of auto commit support. So there's, there's that as well. Okay. And uh, the second one is the can Ibernet, um, you, can we use Ibernate in Asynchronous microservice and non blocking system? So I guess. Who, who asked that question? I would like you to. At the point, you. at the point, it's an anonymous question. That's so a I, leading question, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it might have missed Junior yet. Or <laughs> I, I don't know. We can have more, more answers next week uh, when you guys discuss Vertex. Um, 
So the, the, the question is, uh, you know, can you use Hibernate in an asynchronous fashion or more specifically in a non-blocking fashion? So the answer is today no. Uh, for sure we do rely on the JVC framework, which is blocking, though they are, uh, Oracle is exploring uh, non-blocking APM and has been circulating you know, options around that, uh, that we're looking at literally today. And, and, uh, Why would you have to call an option? Um, yeah, uh, they have operations and completable stage and stuff like that. I, I didn't look too much into the details yet. The, so, so say once we have uh, a non-blocking, you know, JDBC layer, then the next step is to say, does it make sense to have the notion of persistence context and entity manager in those kind of non-blocking kind of applications? Because the answer is maybe no. Maybe the uh, you know unit of operations you're doing is very small, or maybe yes, there is something, and you need to keep the entity manager as a context that you pass around <coughs> your various events. Um, yeah, from the like, really, really initial discussions we were having, it looked like it would re literally be, t for sure, a very different API, and second, maybe a, a different project. Uh, maybe they will reuse some part of Hibernate as it is, but it would probably be, you know, massively different than uh, than the engine we have right now. Though lots of concepts are pretty much the same, because let's forget about reads. <laughs> Who reads? Stuff, right, but the creation, update, and delete operations. Hibernate actually piles them up in memory until it really has to send them to the to the database, um, which means we're not blocking every time you do one of those operations. We are actually piling them up and then applying all of those operations, not in one go because the JDBC layer doesn't really necessarily allow you to do that, but in as uh, small of a window as possible. That could be done in an async fashion. And then we would have to trickle that back up to you know to you as a you know non-blocking API. Uh, the read is more challenging because uh, you've got objects. Objects have associations and they are lazy. So when you load an object, okay, it could be non-blocking and you got a callback when the object is loaded. But what if then you access the collection? Should it be a completable future of a collection and then you've got the whole collection loaded, or should it be an async collection that lets you do size with a callback when the size is back or lets you stream over each element and as soon as they show up, right, there's, there's a lot of interesting questions. What's very likely that if we go that way, the notion of a domain model that doesn't have a technical dependency on the framework, whether it be you know, completable future or maybe this async set or something, then uh, I, I think there will be a, a bit of a tie here. Um, so will, are people ready to go back to those kind of models? I mean, JPA came as a big, big reaction against EJB, you know, inheriting the, the technical... Uh, uh, who is old enough to remember that, by the way? Okay. <laughs> um, um, I think that's a, that, that's a different problem, and it's much uh, less impactful as EJB was, but... Yeah, there would be a bit of a, a shift in mind in uh, in that front. That's all I can say. We've only talked about it for you know uh, hours, not like you know uh, days or, or more. Makes it difficult to use the Sorry, makes it difficult to use the Yeah. Uh, well, the yeah. The, if you have a non-blocking framework like Vertex, how do you use today? Uh, you know, Hibernate the blocking framework, and the, the answer is they have those notion of. Uh, essentially blocking thread pools, where every blocking operation, they shift it to this blocking framework, uh, blocking you know pool, and then do the job the old way. Uh, but there is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a... Okay. okay. Anyway, if we, you know, if we manage to get a, a full non-blocking API, then it would be a more natural thing without having to go that way. Cool. Back to you guys, questions? Yeah? Uh, do you plan to extend um, the query by your example uh, utilities uh, in the future? Uh, 
that, that's my, my question. Any, give us concrete use cases that are missing or? Uh, for example, by um, um, one use case uh, could be uh, combining some uh, uh, different ex examples. Uh, or, um, Two different entities, like yes. user and order, and then? Yes, improving the, the entities uh, matching by uh, uh, multiplicate uh, the examples, or the hierarchy of examples. Yeah, um, so essentially, uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with it, we used to have our own criteria API. Um, so the idea is we want to get rid of all that completely, and we're going to actually just go to extensions to the JPA API, uh, JPA criteria API. So part of that is going to be porting things that we used to support in the old criteria API, for example, um, query by example being one of them. So. Yes, we want to extend it, but you know, like Emmanuel has said, if there's specific things that you would like to see, by far the best way to do it is to get it into Jira so we can see it. Um, you know, possibly, you know, suggest a way to do it. Those kinds of things are, are really the best possibly way. Possibly implement it. Possibly yeah. implement it would be a really good way to get it in. Um, yeah, it just it just really depends. But there's definitely you know. There's a lot to be done when we go to do that in terms of offering the extensions to the criteria, the JPA criteria API. So, but it's definitely stuff we want to do. So I've got two things. Um, I don't know if you know, but the, the Java EE uh, future looks like it's going to be. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of work will be done on the Eclipse side via the EE4J project. So Oracle is. Not donating, but there is a bit of a transfer of the specification work to those uh, more open source, natural and friendly processes. Yeah. That looks like a very natural, you know, stuff to work on with the, you know, other people, both users and implementers of the spec, to get that into JPA, say two, three, or three, or whatever the version will be. And the other one is. Um, Kind of a sneak back to uh, Hibernate Search, but Hibernate Search is uh, so using Lucene and inverted index. In some ways, it's got the mother of all example API because there is an API called More Like This, which in which you say, "Here is an entity. Give me more entities that look like that." And we use the inverted index frequency and uh, the the values token and their relevancy, and try to build a query that will return queries that uh, entities that look like the one you gave. And you either give an entity ID, so that's an entity that already exists. So you've got a book that you like, and you say, give me more like this. And you've got, just like Amazon, popping up stuff you're, you're looking for. So they use fancy machine learning thingy, but you can actually do that in a uh, not so complicated way. Um, the, the other model is to you populate an entity artificially, and you say, give me entities that look like that. It, it doesn't exist in the database, but pretend it does, and give me the one that are looking like that. So it's not really the use case you're looking for, but you know, just wanted to uh, show that to, I mean, let you know that this exists. So your question made me think of one thing. So just today I received an email and there was a, Swish, um, a researcher from Switzerland and he was conducting a study and he was asking how or what do you um, need to do in order to make us integrate features. So if you send a feature request, what what is the deciding factor for us? So he was asking, is it the votes on the issue or is it like the watchers on the issue and this kind of stuff? And um, I was thinking, you got, you got it too? Yeah, maybe, I don't know, you said it perhaps too much with us. And so I was thinking about it and so I was thinking, well, votes and counts, okay, that's one thing. But really, the first thing which helps is if it's described well and if it makes sense, of course, and if it's generally usable. So it's not just like for a corner case, but really the best thing, your best chances are if you contribute and send a patch for it. And I think chances, at least in my opinion, are best to get stuff in. So it's open for us, uh, open to contribute. And I think there is one contributor which I have spotted there, or multiple ones here. Um, so yeah, you can do it and, and just get in touch and work with us. And uh, we... So it's, it's different between uh, 
open source project, uh, even at Red Hat, different between teams at Red Hat, but Hibernate, they, we tend to be a bit um, conservative on the API and features we have, so some of them would are marked as ex experimental, and you might have seen them for years on that, so we're trying to be better on that front, but uh, one thing that is super useful when um, uh, when somebody says, hey, I've got this need, so we, we try to generalize it, and then there is a, like, he's, somebody is writing a proof of concept, and even if it's not the one we will end up going through, seeing an actual implementation, the API, the usage, how it's been implemented, and how it fits or does not fit with the rest of the feature set is super helpful for us to work on the next design without having to go and mess it up the first API and then move to the next one. So even as I know sometimes it's frustrating you say, okay, I've contributed this stuff, it works, I don't know why they, intro, they don't you know, add it in, but it's super useful for us at the first step, and usually it also motivates us to then come back and say, okay, I think if we do it that way, we'll be better and more integrated. So it's also one step further to you know, get it, getting it in. I think that's true for any open source you know, project, so you can apply that to recipe for everywhere. <laughs> Hello, I have a question about a um, little bit performance with, uh, with Hibernate. Recently, um, I was uh, working with uh, an old version of Hibernate uh, 3. Um, so I am using a product that uh, we developed uh, last uh, past years. And now I came to resolve a problem of uh, performances. And I discovered that when uh, a mapping is done uh, between uh, two entities and that we not, uh, or we forgot to, to make it uh, cascading delayed, uh, so we do not, uh, we could not um, remove the parent uh, directly if uh, it is referenced uh, to the, uh, the concerns of uh, uh, one too many, uh, we know, at uh, database normalization. So the, the problem was that uh, to delete uh, all uh, the contents, I need to iterate overall uh, data and delete them one by one. So uh, after that, uh, we run a, ben a benchmark. We discovered that uh, it is not the good way to do it. So we was hesitating to directly write an SQL query to do the delete and or drop uh, all uh, no no sorry not drop, delete or uh, truncate. So when we use the delete, we face that Hibernate is keeping the entity key in memory in the cache, and when uh, sorry, when we delete it uh, by iteration, the entity cache is kept in memory and not updated. And when we recreate the object again, we saw that the entity cache is growing up and not uh, uh, changing down and uh, maybe grow up again. When we use uh, the delay directory the, the directly, uh, we face we see that uh, the level or the amount of entity key is uh, the same and when we start to create an, again some object it's a uh, grow up so it means that it is keeping the already deleted entity key in the memory cache so we are facing to that so i think you might need potentially red hat support <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm so there might be many, many reasons. Uh, I'll try to explain a few, you know, help me guys, everybody. Um, first of all, make sure you use the entity manager of the session just for the conceptual unit of work. Some people call it transaction, but it's sometimes it's a bit of an extended transaction. If you, if you open an entity manager and do works for like the whole day, that's going to be a problem because indeed we keep the object around because we, uh, no, no, we, we, we keep the, well, semantically we keep the notion of uh, equality identity, right? So if you ask for the same object by ID, we should give you the same object 
instance in, in memory. Uh, so if you never remove that, then you know of course that that's scoring. So I don't know if it's a prob uh, a bit of a misdesign and that's the one you've used, but uh, that that's one to keep in mind. Um, generally, if you have bulk deletes to to do. Uh, yeah, the, the, the pattern, man, the manual pattern is to say, okay, I'm clearing my entity manager or my or my session. I'm applying the operation either as SQL, but we also have the JPQL equivalent of the bulk delete that, uh, I don't remember the details, but you can dive into the temporary table and all the magic that, that you're doing. But um, And that would remove everything, like literally as a SQL query, so in, in one go. And then your entity manager being clean, you don't have those phantom keys or phantom reference to your entity. If you use a second level cache for that, uh, well, maybe you shouldn't, and maybe that's fine. Um, otherwise, we also have a cache, a, a way to remove all of the entities of a given type in the cache and clear that. Uh, with, there is an API, I kind of forgot how you reach that. But, uh. Sure, but I think you're, you're asking about the first level cache, correct? You're asking about the cache that's associated with the session? Uh, no, it's um, the cache, um, not behind, inside the uh, ES cache, but uh, the Inside the cache. session. Inside the session. Yeah, so that's called the first level cache. So yeah, what we do, I mean, when you do a delete, um, or once an entity is associated with a session, right, it, it gets put into what's called the first level cache, right? Um, and we have entries in there, so it, it understands the state that an entity is in relation to that session. So for example, it might be managed, it might be deleted, um, is one particular example um, as well. So once you delete something, um, we recognize it as deleted, and then once we physically delete it from the database, we put it into something called gone. So it's we know it's gone from the database. It could be, I mean, I, I thought that once the Maybe you're keeping the transaction open, but I thought once the transaction ended that it it went through and cleaned that stuff out. I, I mean, if if you're seeing something, that's a that would be potentially a bug. But you know, you're also talking about something that I worked on 12 years ago, so I I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say. Um, but if well, I would say open a, a Jira, but we're we're not going to fix it in, in Hibernate three, so I I don't know. But if do you happen to know? I mean, do you do the deletes and then you close, you commit the transaction and then you still see it there? Yes, um, I was providing it and um, when we did a roll by Hibernate, the entity key is following up when we create the object. But what's sure is if you do the delete behind Hibernate back in the database, then we don't know about it. So you have to also clear the entity manager. Yes. Okay. Lithium at some point, listen no. to the transaction, then, you know. The problem is that uh, we, I do not have the hand to, uh, to modify the, let's say, the hibernate part of, uh, it is a product from uh, an editor, so a software uh, editor. So uh, I just have a way to call, uh, the, uh, let's say, the rapid hibernate that will also delete the object into database, and after that, I can flush or commit uh, all my uh, operations. So when I commit, uh, and at the end of the transaction, I see that the entity is remain in memory because uh, I'm calling uh, Ethernet uh, carry iterate, and also for each ID and call the delete for it. And the uh, cache key is growing when I call, and after commit, it's still uh, not. Uh, Maybe we can uh, take that offline like with, with the food because it gets a bit uh, okay. complicated to explain that. You should add one. Yeah, just, just to add one little thing. So Hibernate needs to keep the keys of the things it knows about. So it's not surprised that the keys are going to be there around uh, while you're working, even if the object is actually deleted. Right? But what I'm understanding here is that you're loading some objects to delete them. So that's there is no much point in actually loading them to delete them. So you could you know, just use the foreign key or the restrictions of the table <coughs> definition and let the database handle this for you and you would never not actually load these objects or the keys in session to begin with. So that's what we did um, later, but uh, previously they uh, 
Uh, I have a question about uh, performance. Did uh, is there any benchmark uh, on the performance gain <coughs> using the latest version of uh, Hibernate? I didn't use Hibernate since the version three because uh, performance issue. So persistent entity took uh, seven seconds. So is there any benchmark on that? So if your TT takes seven seconds to be persisted, then um, I would argue that it's probably not necessarily a hybrid network or anything, but... It's, it's not only one entity, it's uh, a lot of... Yeah, yeah, graph, graph. Yeah, yeah but, but that's, that's... I would... I, I'd love to see the test case that shows that, but then that's... Pretty normally not hybrid. I, I would assume. So... Um, some people might I believe otherwise, but we don't believe that you should just ignore what's going on underneath when you use when you use an RM, right? Um, and there are some patterns to follow and anti-patterns into into the usage. Uh, an oldies but a goodies is the what's the name? G uh, uh, <coughs> Christian's book. GP with there are persistence with Hibernate. It's a book by Manning. It's thick, uh, but it's got all of the things to do and not do, especially too many, uh, you know, necessarily cascaded, you know, associations and stuff like that to, to keep stuff a bit uh, bit more uh, maintainable as far as the, the size of your graph when you do an operation. Uh, I don't know if uh, Vlad's book uh, mentioned that. Uh, there is a more recent one, uh, High Persistence, no, what's the name? High Performance Java Persistence. Okay, by uh, uh, Vlad, which is... Uh, you know, also part of the of the team. Uh, that's a shorter book uh, that you you know, might have a look at. Um, so anyway, for for your particular problem, I'm fairly confident that it was more like a pattern <coughs> usage issue than the actual library. Uh, but generally speaking, yeah, the performance team has been on our back for quite a while, and we've been steadily improving things, uh, um, especially like like we were mentioning the the. The memory, the the, not, the the amount of object we were creating for operations, so the amount of object we were creating per second in some critical path were high and reaching, <coughs> compounded with the rest of the usage of the application server, uh, reaching the limit of what the JVM is able to do on the physical hardware of today's. Uh, so we've been working into reducing those for the critical path to path to really go to the next bottleneck. I don't know if it was. Ibernet again, or some other part of the <laughs> app server. I kind of forgot the, the history, but yeah, we've been, you know, helping generally speaking in the on the performance front on, on that. But that's a very different kind of problem you would have seen, you know, for for those than the, what you're saying here. I mean, the other thing I would say too, depending upon depending upon the size and the the number of objects, you know, if you're using, for example, if you're using second level cache. And, you know that's going to add overhead every single time because we have to perform locking in the cache. We have to, you know, we keep these things in the session as well. So you know, the more you add, the more memory you're taking up. Um, there's just all kinds of things, but those are not the use cases that we would recommend. You're like so, for example, if you're saving all those things but you are using second level cache, like there's an option to say bypass the second level cache for this stuff. So I know I'm I know I'm inserting a large graph. I don't want to deal with this right now because I know it's going to add a lot of overhead. <laughs> I've never heard of seven seconds overhead, but... I, I have, but that's generally when people mess up. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. But they're persisting uh, small portions of the graph very frequently. <coughs> that's typically what you see, just like rolling over things like that. Sure. Uh, but that's, again, it's it's not a way you should be using the product. Right, and that's part of what we were talking about with caching as well, because like, you know, what Sane was mentioning, we we create these cache keys just to go do a look, and, you know, for example, an insert, we're never going to find it, right? So, I mean, there's just certain things that, uh, 
you know, are better to, to disable for large, for certain use cases like that, like, you know, hey, just skip the cache. Um, you know, let's, depending upon how you're doing it, um, also the inserts, if, if you're just dealing with one root entity, that's maybe, what I'm about ready to say is it may be so um, applicable, but if you're dealing with, okay, I've got multiple root entities and I'm asking persist over and over, you know, the idea is, well, I'm going to ask for, like, a couple of them and I'm going to clear the cat, clear the session or the entity manager, and then I'm going to do a couple more. And the reason being, uh, the reason that you would do that is to keep the memory footprint of the session down because, you know, obviously it's a JVM, it's constrained in how much memory it's allocated, so the more you use, the slower things are going to run. There's also the, so there is, that's a pattern, and there is an API we have called the stateless session that also says, okay, I'm gonna ignore stuff once I've done them, which is the way to you know address address those kind of uh, of problems as well. Yeah, just one general remark. So what you always should do during development is to enable the logging of the statements which are emitted by Hibernate because what I've experienced is people think they don't need to understand what Hibernate is sending to the database, and that's not really true. You should definitely be aware of what's going on, and this will allow you just very quickly to spot, let's say you do like a n plus one select, this kind of stuff, which would easily give you this sort of bad performance. So you really should track the statements at least during the development so you know what's <coughs> emitted to the database. Uh, and it's a bit of a more granular level, but we also have statistics, so without having to go through the log, which uh, might create performance issue on its own, <laughs> um, we have statistics that we track, like the number of entity we fetch uh, versus, I forgot the, the details, but there are ways to enable the statistics and know about the number of objects loaded or, you know, what, what's happening, the uh, slowest query, those kind of stuff that you could, uh, you know, enable and then dump dump every now and then to try and see, or maybe in a unit test say, I'm expecting less than those amount of things happening, and instead, if instead of loading 10 objects, you've got 1,200, maybe there is a eager object that should have been, an association that should have been made lazy or things like that. Well, it's a very uh, fruitful uh, subject. <laughs> yeah, one other thing you have to be careful about is that um, when you save a lot of, when you create a lot of entities or when you update a lot of entities, they are piling up in the session, as um, Steve mentioned, and when you do the next save, you will have to check that the entities in the session, have, if the entities in the session have been modified or not. So this is called dirty checking, and if you don't um, empty you know, if you don't clear your session from time to time, you end up with your query, with your safe uh, calls being very slow. So this is a typical pattern where you you start with a hundred object and everything is fine, and when you are at ten thousand, it just goes very, very, very slow. So um, yeah, this is also a typical issue you can have. It's quite related, actually. Um, we are using uh, Hibernate behind uh, GPI um, uh, at work, and uh, we are heavily using uh, entity graphs, and we, we run on some issues with uh, entity graphs and already loaded objects um, in, the, uh, in the cache, uh, in the level 2 cache, because uh, when we are asking for uh, an entity with uh, a specific entity graph to be applied, um, if the entity is already loaded, the entity graph will not be um, applied. Do you plan to um, to make things evolve on this point? I'm not sure how much to say here. Um, entity graphs were essentially forced upon us. <laughs> Um, is the best way to say it. Um, so we implemented it the way that it needed to pass the TCK, and we kind of fired and forgot. Um, but yes, um, actually as part of the 6.0 work that we were talking about, I'm revisiting that, um, so that as we're building this, this SQM model, like, so say for example, I, I say you, 
say you pass me an HQL that says, you know, get me this and fetch this, right? That's all fine, but you also might pass in an entity graph, like the load and fetch stuff, and you might want to fetch something else, right? So essentially I'm working on um, merging all that stuff together to actually build a, a, a complete SQM. So this is everything we need. Um, and yeah, I mean, we could, do, we could do stuff like that for sure. I mean, at that step, we know, oh, okay, well, this is actually in cache, potentially. I mean, we could do things like that, but I don't know. We'll have to see. Could we look up in the cache? Because I thought the, the graph would be just go to the database and all the second level cache, right? <coughs> no, like... No, it's not. Uh, no, um, well, it depends on your operation. Like, you're talking about a load, like load by ID. Yeah, find find one. Yeah, so I mean, for example, right? If it's um, you know, if it's a collection, right? We know that oh, this this entity collection is actually a cache, so we could just not ma even make that part of the SQL. So I mean, I think that's that's kind of what he's asking about. Do we have any flag to just like at some point you mentioned we could? We don't do that. Ah, at all. Okay. I'm that's that's what we could. I'm saying that's what we could potentially do as we move to the SQL model. Um, I know as the user of such a thing, uh, not entity graph, but the notion of is it in the second level cache versus go to the database, Hibernate Search, uh, what it does is it, it do a query with, with the index. Index gives back uh, the type and the ID of the object. And then we want to give you manage objects back. So we ask Hibernate to or the object relational mapper to load it. And then we, yeah, it, it depends, right? Sometimes we, so you as a user know that most of the entity might be in the second level cache and you want to do a fetch of the object first and then, um, and if it's not there, go to the database for the rest. Sometimes you know that only maybe 2% will be in the second level cache and that would be just a waste to look, 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 look and then do the query for the rest. So we've got some flags at the Hibernate search level where we say, look, just forget about the second level cache, go, do the query, ignore even the, do we can even ignore the session? Because we can, right? Yeah. yeah. So we, um, yeah, we, we ended up saying it's, uh, it's we cannot ma magic, magically guess that, so we will give flags to the user to, you know, address that. So I guess we could copy the same kind of patterns on the, on the entity graph and then inject that, offer that kind of options to... Uh... Just just to add something. So it, it, in the Hibernate search case, it's worth potentially skipping the session, even if session is very cheap for a single entity because we're loading a list of entities. So we can go to the database with the, to, to fetch the whole list in one go. And that's the reason why it might be sensible to skip the session, but if you are doing a find, it's probably never sensible to try skipping the session first. So it's a bit different. Well, do, do you mean that this is a, a, a bad practice to, to use some TT graphs with uh, with Arbonne? It seems to tell us that are not very. Um, it's not my favorite API. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I don't know if it's best practice or not. Um, I mean, I get the, I, I get what they were trying to, trying to do. Um, it, it's just you know, this is philosophical, right? I mean, it's just I, I come from a background where you you let things bake, and then oh, okay, this is a great idea. I understand that somebody baked this, but you know, that's a kind of much smaller community, and I, I, I would have much rather had that, you know embedded and, and used for a while and that because there's I don't know it's just not a very nice way to do it. it's kind of like criteria right it gets really verbose and, and it's just not a really nice way to do it I mean I come from vSAM and SQL I mean you can you can give me an HQL and it's very concise and I know people don't like it but because it's you know you can change and all that sort of stuff but it's nice and concise and, and you can do a lot of powerful things to me that's a really nice API to do things quickly um, I, I'm, I'm personally not a fan of it, but you know it's in the spec, so we have to do it. So we might as well, at some point, do it the best we can. Um, and you know the plan is to do that, but I mean, you see, it's like on on the ORM stuff, it's really just about three people that do it. So I mean, it's there, there's not there's a resource thing there. So you know, 
going back to the thing we like to say, I mean, if it's something you really want, you know, the best way to get it in is to help contribute. <laughs> you know? So there's that. <laughs> Uh, the other one is to, if you realize you've got performance issues on some some of the entity graph that you're using, just yeah, fall back to HQL for for those key ones. Uh, hopefully, your team is not like uh, super strict about you almost always use this versus that. But then you know, if you realize, look, it doesn't fit my build here, so let me go back to you know just HQL to really decide what I fetch exactly, and then just load it. So. Yeah, it would be a bit different for those key areas, but then you, you will have solved your 80% you know, problems or whatever. I mean, I know we had the other, the other issue as well where, you know, if you say load something, um, like entity manager find, right? And we find it in the first level cache, and you've also given us a, a fetch graph. We actually don't necessarily load all the stuff. That's the issue. Maybe. So we find it first, but then it's... Oh, I'm sorry. Is that what you're asking about? <laughs> I'm sorry. I totally misunderstood. Um, yeah, no, that that totally, totally is actually uh, that is totally accurate. Yeah, we don't. And it's really like I said before. It's born out of the fact of, um, you know, this is something that we were essentially forced to do. So, you know, okay, well, let's get it to the state that we at least need it to be able. I mean, quite honestly, let's pass the TCK, um, the JPA TCK, and call it a day. But, you know, uh, yeah, so we are at the point where, with six, I want to start improving. I guess if you clean up the entity, well, if you, yeah, if you, how can you remove an entity from the, if you remove an entity from the session and then use the graph, then you're, yes. we're back yes. to the yes. normal yes. thing, right? Yes. Not great, but hey, here's a workaround for you. <laughs> okay. That's, I see a hand. Euh, ma question elle est très simple, je ne veux pas aller en français, ça va euh, En fait, depuis, euh, depuis quelques années, on a vu euh, l'émergence de, des technologies d'abstraction pour l'accès aux données, aux données comme euh, j'entends par là, par exemple, les Generic DAO, ou bien euh, ce coffre des technologies comme Spring Data. Spring Data. Euh, Est-ce est que vous ne vous sentez pas un peu menacé ou bien Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que demain, ces technologies-là vont euh, éclipser euh, totalement euh, les planètes C'est-à-dire en ajoutant une abstraction au-dessus Peut-être que... So the question is, uh, there is the emergence of a lot of um, data access abstraction in recent years, generic DAO, which I don't know what that is, uh, but also Spring Data, and are you guys feeling threatened by, by this? So the answer is no, we're sleeping fine. <laughs> um, I probably should go back here. Uh, but the, yeah, so, so first of all, um, I, so I don't know about generic DAO, right? But um, definitely there's been, um, when, when we started Hibernate and Hibernate became popular, it's been a big fight of an ORM has a lot of overhead, it's really bad for you, da da da. And then people accepted that it was solving you know, 80 or 90% of your usage and then for the 10% where it was not really fitting, you were going back to the basics. And then we went at the you know, long time of everything was fine and then there, is, uh, there has been, you know, I'd say maybe five ex each year from know, in the past, like a rethinking, and some people really don't like the ORM model, and I guess that's fine. We're not going to change the the tool that is addressing a lot of concern just because they don't like an ORM. They probably should use something else. That That's all fine for us. Spring Data specifically, actually, if you look at it, uh, it's just using Hibernate underneath. If you use Spring Data JPA, that's it's just JPA with some nice stuff on top of it. Uh, one of them is this... Um, magic creation of a query based on the name of the methods, which internally we don't really believe much in that. It feels like, okay, it's fine for the hello world kind of examples, and then very quickly you have to write the queries anyway. And I'm like Steve, I, I like to write a, a string, SQL-ish or HQL that does represent my query. So for me, that's not the, those abstractions are not the, the right one, but it's fine if people use them. So, so yes, we're 
a bit less used directly as an API, but we're still there. I mean, uh, uh, you mentioned Grace a bit before. Grace and Gorm, they use Hibernate underneath, and you know we've had back and forth because they were having some <coughs> bugs and limitation from from us, and we tried to fix them. Some of them took a long time. Actually, we fixed that one like uh, maybe a month and a half ago. So. <laughs> Um, otherwise, I was reminded of that. Um, yeah, uh, we're still massively used then, so yeah, we're fine. So, not about talking about being feeling threatened, but I would say one big change is this async movement. So let's say people really would like to talk asynchronously to that database or reactively. This is definitely something which will require quite a lot of work if we would like to so support this kind of model. So I see this as a big change. time my question is about uh, architecture uh, with um, the new uh, monolith components like uh, Ibernet Search and maybe uh, Ibernet Validator. Uh, can I, for example, use Ibernet Search with all version, or, uh, all version of Ibernet uh, in front of all version of Ibernet and how uh, can it uh, work with the core? Uh, without using the last, uh, the latest version of uh, the monolith uh, Ethernet core. And also, uh, I would like to understand why um, or what is the target of Ethernet validator, um, uh, being validator. Because I, I know that um, when I define my entities, I directly set up the constraints inside and uh, why I need to have the entity define it uh, <coughs> separately and also add a library to especially uh, define the, um, the contents between them. Sorry. Uh, so two very good questions. Uh, maybe we could show up the, the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you answer the support one or you, both of them? Okay. So basically, you won't be able to use the latest version of Surf with the Ibernet 3, if it's your question. <laughs> but um, so the idea is that we we recently revamped um, this part of the website, um, the releases part, to include a compatibility matrix to tell you, okay, with this version of ORM, um, you are able to use this version of Surf. So at at the moment, yeah, overview. Just click on overview. Yeah, and at the bottom. Yeah, so here you have the compatibility matrix with the current version we support. So <coughs> basically, you have 5.6, which supports Hypernet ORM 5.0 and 5.1. And then you have the latest and greatest version, which are also the stable version, the current stable version is 5.8. It supports only Hibernate ORM 5.2 and will probably support Hibernate ORM 5.3. And then you have the, um, our current and stable version, not really unstable, but in progress, uh, which on also only supports Hibernate 5.2. So you have to, so Maybe you can do some archaeology and find a version of Hibernate search. search. I, I'm not sure we we ever supported uh, Hibernate 3. Yeah, 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 we did. So at some point you can do some archaeology and find some older version. But yeah, if you encounter some bugs, we won't really be able to fix them because we don't support them anymore. So you don't have to use the latest and greatest version of every component, but yeah, we only support a, a range of versions. So, and yeah, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, on on Hibernate Validator, the answer is slightly different. At least since Bin Validation, which is a standard, the actual integration between JPA and Bin Validation, I don't know who wrote the spec, that was very good, <laughs> um, actually is, is standardized. So you can use any version of Validator as long as they support the Bin Validation, say 1.1, 1 
with you know any version of Hibernate, say two dot something and uh, onwards of the GP one. Yeah, and then the second question, big question you had is why why defining the constraints via the annotations of bin validation instead of directly in your getters or in the method or your business methods? So who is up for this one? Yo, yo. Yeah. Okay, so it's a style which you can use if you like it. I, I would not oppose. Um, one advantage of, um, of or let's say if you do this consistency, let's say you have dedicated types for all your properties, so you have an email type and you have a name type, usually this will give you lots of headaches if it comes to integrating with other frameworks. So let's say you bind those properties to UI framework or to JPA, you will need to define attribute converters or whatever it's called in the UI framework, so you have to convert this. And then also the annotations, it's a declarative approach which allows you to, for instance, extract metadata out of this. So what we also have is a metadata retrieval API which allows us to get all the constraints which apply to your model. And then, for instance, you can apply them on the client side. So let's say you have a front end which you implement using Angular or something. You could use this metadata API, fetch all the constraints and validate them already on the client side before even going to the server and have your validation running there. And then there's also this notion of validation groups, which essentially allows you to apply different sets of constraints depending on, let's say, some sort of use case or some sort of external context, which I think would not be as easy if it would be baked into dedicated types. So that's my answer for that. One thing also is, uh, so bin validation being a standard, it's been embraced by uh, frameworks. So uh, us, but every JPA provider, um, lots of UI framework, you know, I mean, we work with them in the expert group and uh, they really embraced it. So, you know, Wicked, uh, even GWT for, for that, they actually ported like a, like a, a Java to JavaScript kind of, of binding of those um, Spring, yeah, Spring Web and Spring MVC and so on. So you declare them once, uh, yeah, JAXRS, uh, CDI and so on, so on. So you declare your constraint once and all of those frameworks actually, when the data is here, will go and they will be executable and, and validatable, not just where you put your business method, but everywhere where it matters. Everywhere where you transform data from outside, say a UI, to Java, maybe a business entry, or when you go from the Java universe to the database universe, that's JPA. That's, that's the advantage. And I think we need to stop here yeah, to we get have, some food. Yeah. We have to eat the food, otherwise uh, we'll be... Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask two? I don't know. Can you? Well, so you won't be able to eat. It's but up to fine. you. <laughs> it will be very short. So, the, um, there are so you can boo. Oh. Yeah. So the, the good thing is that you can also capitalize on your constraints. So you can reuse them everywhere. You can share them between projects. Uh, you can go on the web and find some already implemented constraints. There are some for uh, ISBN, the, um, the standard for books. Um, you have, um, yeah, so it's, it's really nice to be able to reuse uh, things that people have already done. Uh, the other thing is that it's really readable because you declare your entity and then you just put your constraints on your properties and yeah, that's it. You, you don't have boilerplate code everywhere trying to validate everything. You just say, okay, this is a list of email. Okay, this is an ISBN, and so I think it makes you, your, yeah, your domain model more readable uh, than if you had a lot of boilerplate code in your services, on your getters, and your setters. Just real quick too, uh, if you use iRate specifically and you generate the schema, and you generate the schema, depending, I mean, Certain, certain check constraints aren't really expressible in terms of what we're doing in terms of beam validation, but we will actually export a lot of these to the database as well. So we actually create check constraints. So it's, I mean, ultimately the database is the truth, right? So you want to make sure it's correct there. <laughs>